name's David Lorimer, and I'm the Programme Director of the Scientific and Medical Network, and I'm here with Ken Wilbur to talk about uh, the network and his work um, on the occasion of our Golden Jubilee. Um, in, in 19, we founded in 1973, so 2023 is our Golden Jubilee. Uh, welcome, Ken. Um, very nice to, to see you, and thanks for being with us. Thank um, you, Dave. I'm going to start by, and this is probably a, a question I'm very interested in hearing your answer. You know, who and or what inspired you in your line of work? Because you've been you've been in your line of work really almost your whole life, I think. Yeah, well, because I write from sort of an integral perspective, I pretty much include as many major philosophers as I can. So I've been influenced by virtually everybody, uh, Plato, Plotinus, Augustine, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, on up to today's Foucault and Derrida. Um, and one modern philosopher that's had a particular useful effect on me is that of Jürgen Abermas. He, of course, is a member of the Frankfurt School whose main aim was to integrate, quote, Buddha and Freud. So that's what they started out they wanted to do. They liked Freud very much because of the importance of his work in general, but they felt it didn't cover everything. And so when they said they wanted to unite Freud and Buddha, by Buddha, they meant all of the important spiritual philosophers. And so I particularly got a lot out of Habermas's work because he completely followed that approach. And he included in his major philosophy all of the developmental psychologists. So he includes the work of Jane Lovinger, Lawrence Kohlberg, and so on. And those developmental psychologists had a particular effect on me because they were one of the first ones to point out that we all go through several different stages of our own development and each stage has a different worldview so to use Gene Gepser's terminology we all go through an archaic stage then a magic stage then a mythic stage then a rational stage, then a pluralistic stage, and finally an integral or integrated stage. And that particularly made a lot of sense to me because I had read so many philosophers and they all essentially disagreed. Mm. I could see each of them coming from a different worldview. And that made a lot of sense. Not only did it work, would, not only was it true, but it just made an enormous amount of overall rational sense to me. Um, and so you can see that I've had a very, very variegated influence. And the whole point was to continue that developmental approach and to show how all of these major philosophers we're on to some important worldview. And each of their major truths were indeed true, if partial truths. Indeed, indeed. And so that made a great deal of sense to me. And I wrote some 30 plus books integrating all of their worldviews according to the major stage it had unfolded from. And that made a lot of sense as well. And I tried to explain how each of them was coming from a magic place or a mythic place or um, a rational place or a pluralistic place or an integrated place. Um, yeah, so yes. And Moss was coming from an integrated stage of development. And that's what he was trying to do in his work was integrate as many major approaches to reality as he could. And he did a very, very good job of it. 
Yeah, so and um, were you a very early reader in the sense that you started reading these these sort of books when you were 15 or 16? Um, right. When, when when did you really get going, as it were? When did I get? I mean, in terms of reading, when when were you sort of? Um, when did your quest really start? Um. Well, I did start reading voluminously when I was thirteen or fourteen. Okay. And and um, that's when I really sort of got hooked on it, so to speak. Um, and I really went deeply into as many different philosophers as I could find. Um, and I always got something incredibly important out of each of them. And that right there told me that they each had true, if partial, realities, because they were coming from different perspectives or different stages of reality. And that made a great deal of sense and allowed me to indeed be impressed by a particular philosopher and take away what truth he offered me. But I would fit that truth into a larger perspective, what I started calling an integral perspective. Well, and, that, yes, that, that's, that sort of leads into my next question, um, which right. I think you already started to answer, which is what, what you might regard as your most significant contribution. Um, because yeah. your your integral philosophy and psychology is is probably that, but maybe you'd like to explain a little bit more about that and how you see it now looking back. Yeah, well, um, the most significant influence on me was indeed the core of developmental researchers. And I think my most important contribution is um, in integral psychology, for example, I included charts of over 100 different developmental approaches. And they all had some degree of truth. And as you line them next to each other, and I did in 12 or 13 charts, I included all 100 developmental models and the major stages that they presented. And as you looked at all these stages of development, you could see how they were all similar. So a, a stage three edition of a particular developmental psychology was similar to all stage three levels in all of the different approaches. And so you could see that they were approaching similar realities, but they were often looking at different types of intelligence that human beings have. So they would study cognitive intelligence like Piaget or moral intelligence like Kohlberg or self-intelligence like Lovinger and so on. And so Piaget would study cognitive development and he had um natural intelligence and then pre-operational concrete and then concrete operational and then formal operational and then systemic and integrated stages and jane lovinger would have self um dominant stages and then conformist stages and then awakening stages or rational stages, and then autonomous stages, and then integrated stages. And you could, as you looked at all of these different stage conceptions, you could see the similarities that each of them had with all of the others. And so I, that's where I developed my own particular stages of development was taking what each of them had in common as a particular stage. So my stage three would have similarities with all of the stage three models. And then stage four would have similarities to all of the stage four and the different models. And by and large, this worked. 
And that gave me a way to integrate virtually any major philosopher with any other major philosopher. And I think that was my best contribution is coming up with a framework, an overall integral framework that united and integrated most major philosophers. And I Indeed. still, <clears throat> it's still true today. Um, and did you, did you have a kind of aha moment um, at a certain point where you, you know, would came up, let's say with your AQAL, the quadrant system, um, did that, did that, uh, arrive in a moment of insight or did you gradually develop it? Um, it was a major insight that I had. And one of the ways that it developed is that I had been for quite some time keeping lists of all of the major developmental models. And at one time, I even took those big yellow legal pads and I put one developmental model on each page of that mm -hmm. uh, paper. So I had like dozens and dozens of pages of paper lying all over the floor in my apartment. And by that time, I had started studying Zen because I had actually had a Satori-like experience when I was in my very early teens. And so I started practicing Zen Buddhist meditation. And I soon learned that they had a certain number of stages of development as well. And they're sometimes summarized as the 10 ox herding pictures. And it's just pictures of uh, an ox going through various stages of its own realization. And the ox stood for your mind or your Buddha nature. And when I saw those stages of development, I got this flash. Now, the flash turned out to be both right and wrong. It was a flash because I thought those Zen ox herding stages were measuring the same thing that all the developmental models were explaining. And that was an important insight in that Zen, there are stages of development in Zen realization, but they're not measuring the same stages that developmental psychologists are. So Zen Buddhism is measuring what you could call stages of awakening or stages of enlightenment or self-realization. And that part of that self-realization is realizing that the individual self is an illusion. That's the famous Buddhist no self anatta doctrine. And Buddhism is well known for not believing in an individual self. It transcends the self to a big self or a Buddha mind. But that's not what developmental models are measuring. What they're measuring are the stages that this individual self actually goes through in its own development. So an individual self will go from an archaic stage to a magic stage, to a mythic stage, to a rational stage, to a pluralistic stage, to an integrated stage. And beyond an integrated stage is a self-awakening realization and that realization transcends the separate self altogether but very few developmental models go that far they all stop around pluralistic or integrated stages of this illusory separate self sense and it does indeed get bigger and bigger at each stage of growth so one way to look at that is, is you're getting more and more caught in illusion. But another way to look at it is this individual self really does grow and expand and become more encompassing. And if you took it to the next stage, you'd have an all encompassing or big self. And that's what Zen is measuring. It's the emergence of this big self or enlightened self or awaken self. So yes. 
the notion that there is an ongoing self-development came to me as a sudden insight. But the exact nature of that growth and development, that continued to grow and expand as I understood more carefully what all of what I call the growing up models were talking about. And those were the individual stages, like archaic, the magic, to mythic, the rational, the pluralistic, the integral, that the individual self tended to grow and evolve through. So those are the same stages that we see in evolution, if we look at overall evolutionary unfolding. And it's the same stages we see in cultural development. So when I developed the four quadrant model, individual interior growing up is what's called the upper left and cultural growth is the lower left because the upper left deals with the individual interiors of an individual whole on and the lower levels deal with the pluralistic or collective uh, um, unification of various individual selves and that's what we find in culture is that many individual selves are growing through a collective unfolding. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. And yet to clarify themselves. As yes. And, and so there's a little, it, it, Zen was coming at it with, when they, as it were, from a different angle or a different trajectory and, and starting. Uh, but, but there's both there's developmental processes in both cases. I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? But, right. Um, and I see the sort of more universalization of the self. It's this, it's this, um, the growth, as it were, or the expansion of the small self to the capital S self. But then that the universality means that it it isn't a self in the same sense that the the growth process assumed. That sort of the growth uh, process. Yeah. No, the growth process assumed. And so the, the 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 one in a sense is like it's bottom up, um, and then the other one almost comes from universal to the particular. Yeah, if I can put it that uh, way. Well, that's right. In my view, um, everything in the universe is a whole on which is a term author Kessler invented, which means a whole that is part of a larger whole. And that's true for every particle in the universe. Quarks are holes that are parts of subatomic particles like protons, neutrons, electrons, and so on. And those subatomic particles are each whole individuals that are part of a whole atom. And then each whole atom is part of a whole molecule. And each molecule is part of an individual cell. And each individual cell is part of a multicellular organism. And organisms go through, we have a whole tree of life of organisms, each one, which is a whole that contains its predecessor. So we have fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, humans, and each higher one of those animals is a more complex, more holistic system. So the same is true of humans in comparison to other mammals and mammals in comparison to reptiles. And so the human brain even has three layers of a reptilian brain stem, a mammalian limbic system, and a human neocortex. So um, what I realized is that each individual thing, besides being a holon, each holon belongs to one of four major quadrants. And a quadrant is a particular perspective that the whole on takes. So we already have English words for this. We have first person, second person, and third person perspective pronouns. And first person is the person speaking, I, me, mine, and so on. 
second person is the person being spoken to. So that's you or thou or yours. And third person is the person or thing being spoken about. So that's a he, she, they, them, an it or an its. And they stick the quadrants in that all of the left-hand quadrants are, well, all of the upper quadrants are of individuals. So the upper left, it contains an I, a, a me, a mine, and so on. And the lower left quadrant contains the multiples of I. And the plural of an I is a we. So that's where we get cultural or societal, group, collective. And then those are all perspectives from the interior of an individual or collective whole on. It's an I or a we or um, an us or an ours. And the exterior is all exterior perspectives. So that's a he or she, or importantly, an it or an its. So the upper right quadrant is, contains individual holons, like atom to molecule to cell to organism. And a lower right contains systems or collectives of those. So ecological systems, for example, or social systems. And in the left-hand quadrants, we have I. So we have Piaget's cognitive development. We have several multiple intelligences that each individual I or human kind of adopt. So we have cognitive intelligence, emotional intelligence, moral intelligence, spiritual intelligence, aesthetic intelligence, and so on. Most psychologists acknowledge around a dozen or so multiple yeah. intelligences. And then the lower left quadrant is what happened when all those eyes get together and form cultures. And cultures were traditionally, that's where the terms archaic culture, magic culture, mythic culture, rational culture, pluralistic culture, and integral culture were first used in that sense by Jean Piaget. So we have the inside and the outside of an individual and a collective. And those are very real, very obvious perspectives that every individual organism can take. And I, of course, maintain that holons all the way down have a spark of awareness or a spark of consciousness. So even atoms have a certain I awareness and a we awareness. Um, and then, of course, every holon has an exterior. So there's atoms with their exterior and molecules with their exterior and um, individual organisms. And all of those are named from the exterior view that we have of them. So when we say an atom, we don't usually mean an atom of consciousness. We mean a material atom. So if we were talking about an atom of consciousness, that would be the upper left quadrant. Mm. But a material atom is the same whole on looked at from an exterior point of view. So that would be an atom, a material atom, a material molecule, a material organism, a material multicellular organism, and so on. Yes, well, that's a very, very clear. Thank you very much, Ken. That's a very clear exposition uh, of the the quadrants. And just to let you know, uh, Arthur Kerstler was, in fact, one of the early members of the Scientific and Medical Network, um, along with E.F. Schumacher and, and others. Um, oh, I'd, like to go on, yeah, I'd like to go on to the next question, which is how you see the evolution of consciousness studies and the relationship between science and spirituality over the next 20 years. What kind of developments would you expect to see? Yeah, well, I think their interaction is going to increase. And I think that's going to happen because we're starting to recognize that there are different types of wholeness. 
And each type of wholeness has a developmental unfolding. So we have a cognitive wholeness or an integrated view of the world. And that goes through, of course, the stages from archaic to magic or pre-operational thinking to mythic or concrete operational thinking to rational or formal operational thinking to pluralistic thinking to integrated thinking. And integrated thinking is a whole, a holistic type of thinking. Um, and then we have an emotional wholeness. And that also goes through early stages that are emotional equivalents of archaic, magic, mythic, rational, pluralistic, and integral. Um, and we have an aesthetic intelligence, which gives a wholeness of beauty or beauty seen as a whole. And that also goes through several stages of increasing unity of beauty and wholeness. And then we have a spiritual intelligence. And that also goes through uh, different models vary, but anywhere from six to 10 major stages of spiritual realization. Um, so the um, spiritual Christian mystic version is with the cave of light and you start just identified with your own organism and then you expand that through several stages and end up identified with a collective social organism and then you can even transcend that and have an awakening as god consciousness or christ consciousness a oneness with the ultimate um, christ or ultimate unity consciousness and what's going to happen as these different developmental sequences are understood is people are going to see that spiritual development itself goes through several major stages of increasing growth and development. And as soon as they realize that, they're going to realize that rational development also goes through several stages of development. And they're going to start to see the similarities of those stages. And that's going to bring science and religion very close together. And the reason I think this is going to happen, but hasn't yet happened, is that it's not very easy seeing that we actually go through stages of development. Because whenever you undergo a new stage of development, you're not aware of that. If you're moving from concrete operational mythic thinking to formal operational rational thinking, which most people do in early adolescence, around age 11 or 12, rational thinking tends to emerge. But you're not aware of a stage of development emerging when it does emerge. You're just not aware of it. You just simply start thinking in that new way. And if you sit down and look at it and sort of study the situation, you'll go, oh, wait, I'm thinking in rational terms. When did I start doing that? And you might trace it back to, well, it wasn't when I was five years old because I was believing in Santa Claus and the tooth fairy. Mm. When I was five, I was thinking in mythic terms. Um, so it, it takes quite a bit of understanding to come up with developmental stages. And they're so hard to spot that they were only first spotted about a hundred years ago by an American psychologist called James Mark Baldwin. He was a good friend with William James, who's probably America's most famous psychologist. Mm -hmm. And William James was studying states of development. So he looked at um, the varieties of religious experience. Indeed. And he saw them all going through these certain stages of development. And almost all of the Christian mystical traditions themselves recognized that there were five or six or seven major stages of unfolding of a true unity consciousness or a true Christ consciousness. 
and they were aware of these stages of development and they wrote about them um, and about the stages that they went through. Um, so the, and, the, the answer, sort of broad answer would be that the, you see the evolution of consciousness studies as the evolution along these trajectories of stages. Uh, and this will happen more explicitly and consciously because it's already happening. Right. And the difference between waking up stages and those developmental growing up stages, I call the stages of waking up and growing up. And both of them give a type of wholeness at their highest stages. They're both very holistic and often described in terms of unity consciousness or unity awareness or a unity of rationality in an integrated stage. And once that, those are understood, you tend to look around for stages. And so when you look at spirituality and you see them talking about stages, and then you look at growing up and you see them talking about stages, you tend to try to put these stages together. And you have to be very careful there because, again, they're dealing with two different types of stages. But they are roughly correlated. And when you see that, you'll see the great similarity in the stages that science goes through and the stages that spirituality goes through. And when you start to see those connections, you'll realize how similarly related are the domains of science and the domains of real spirituality or a true mystical awakening spirituality. And so I think because starting in the 50s, we had so many models of human growing up development. We had literally dozens and dozens of models came just almost out of nowhere. And they all stem from James Mark Baldwin, who was working around the turn of the century. He was working around 1900 to 1910, mm. as was William James. And again, while James was studying the states of awaking up intelligence, James Mark Baldwin discovered structures of growing up. And structures are different from states. States are any first person direct experience that you're now having. That's your state of consciousness. So if you're aware of the typical material world, that's called the waking up state. And then when you sleep at night, that's called a dream state. And when you go into deep formless sleep, that's called a causal state or a formless state. And then when you wake up to an ever present state of awareness that's present at all states of awareness, that's called the waking up state because you're in the same state that you're in when you're waking, dreaming, and sleeping. There's a type of consciousness that's present in each of those states of awareness. And when you become aware of that consciousness, that's called the fourth state because it's after the first state of waking, Indeed. second state of dreaming, third state of consciousness. Your fourth state is waking up to the ever-present awareness that's present in all three of those states. And there is an ever-present consciousness that is aware of deep dreamless sleep. And this has actually been measured on EEG machines. And there's a state that's aware of dreaming. And you can actually become aware of that state in what's called a lucid dream. Lucid dream, indeed. You become aware that you are dreaming. You're aware of the consciousness of the dream. And then, of course, the consciousness that you have in everyday waking life is your general, is, is a, an obvious awareness or consciousness of waking state. And do you, do you think that, I mean, if we look at it from a cultural point of view, I think a lot of people are thinking that we, we need a sort of more generalized spiritual awakening in order to shift um, into a more integral and even ecological systemic world view because we're faced yeah. with a situation where the existing um, unsystemic linear 
um, profit right. making is is really driving us over the cliff. So do, right. how, how do you see, do you see this process? I mean, I think it is happening, but how, what's your take on that? Yeah, it is happening. And the main reason it's happening in an increasing amount stems from all those developmental models that exploded in the 50s and 60s. Because when people were looking at, say, the four or five major stages of Piaget's cognitive development, they saw an increasing awareness. And that's right. Um, Pre-operational cognition is often called magical cognition. And magical cognition is not aware of very holistic situations. It's aware of like word magic or the, the essence of magic is since the self is not very well differentiated from the world, the self or subject and the world or object stay very undifferentiated, almost united, except it's not an integrated move. It just hasn't yet differentiated. So the thought is that if you change the word, you'll actually change the thing. And that's called word magic. So if I change what I'm thinking about a tree or a bush or an animal, it'll actually change the animal magically. And that's what magic is. And then we get rid of magic when we move to mythic. And mythic is just that. It's a bunch of gods and goddesses and mythic scenes. So it's Zeus and Apollo and Aphrodite and all of that. And we no longer contain the capacity for magic, but magic is transferred to the gods and goddesses. So Zeus, if I know how to approach Zeus correctly, like praying or sacrificing or chanting or whatnot, I can talk Zeus into doing something beneficial for me. So if I pray to the goddess, she will make my crops grow. She has magic and she can do all of these things at a distance. Um, and because we became aware of our consciousness through these developmental models, and particularly with an explosion of awareness in the 50s and 60s, then we're going to we recognize both the limitations of our ordinary consciousness and the expanded capacity of different states of consciousness. So if I'm actually having the capacities of a dream state in my waking state, I'll be very creative. I might be a writer or a poet or even a, a inventive scientist because I'm tapping into this extraordinarily creative dream capacity. And deep formless sleep is a vast expansion of formless awareness. And that's a very creative state because it's so expansive and is itself without any specific form. So it's called the formless state of awareness. And as we just start realizing that we have more capacities in this waking state than we normally realize, then we can start looking for ways to expand it. And that generally we find out. And also what happened in the 60s, which was a big boon to increasing consciousness is we had the psychedelic revolution. Yes, and that's all coming back, isn't it? It's exactly, and it's slowly coming back. And what we realize in the psychedelic revolution is that our ordinary consciousness, if we take LSD or mescaline or psilocybin, will just explode in, in a huge either unity awareness or just in a multicolored universe. And we'll actually have a sort of lucid dream state actually unfolding in front of our very own eyes. And that's an enormous expansion from our ordinary state-specific, drab, linear consciousness. 
And uh, it caused so can, enormous change in art forms and color use and so on. It was a no, huge quite, development. Absolutely. And does, does this, I mean, it, the, there's a certain inexorability about um, the this growing awareness uh, as you're expressing it. So does that make you fundamentally optimistic about the future? Um, well, yeah, it does. Simply because to the extent that that's actually happening, you're having an increase in consciousness and awareness of consciousness. And so you're likely to have a lucid dream or a full blown formless awareness experience and all of those are good news because all of those show us expanding capacities of our own ordinary waking awareness and that will tend to increase our artistic capacity our creative capacity um, the use of colors and different art forms all in the waking state of awareness and that's nothing but good news really and and expansion of empathy i think as well and that i think is crucial uh, in ethical terms um you know, to expand our capacity for empathy yeah definitely and that increasing empathy one of the main reasons that we get a huge increase in empathy is when we have unitary like experiences because then we realize that that other person, that it out there, is actually part of a full-bodied I awareness. It's part of a we-ness. The plural of I is we. And when we get that expansion, we naturally attune ourselves to the feeling that that other person is having. And so we get very empathetic. And that's a very strong sensation of feeling what another person is feeling and that's a very useful and extraordinary gift actually no absolutely and um ken i'm just coming to the final question which is maybe the most difficult um which is um what do you think have been your most important lessons from life um both personally and professionally yeah um well, I guess I'd keep it on the same theme. The lessons that I have learned most from life is when I look at it through an integral perspective. And then I see unity everywhere. I mean, the world is nothing but a vast wholeness of individual beings. But all of them are interwoven and interconnected in this complete unity. And I've had those experiences fairly often. Um, I mean, not regularly, but mm. often enough. I've had a dozen or so Satori-like experiences. And all of them bring home very powerfully the unique unity of this universe. I mean, it started from a single entity and it's remained interwoven through all of its stages of growth and development, you can see an integral impulse at the very heart of the universe. And that has been probably the most important lesson that I've learned. And, and one that we need to understand as a culture in order to transform our systems in that direction. That's right. That's correct. And that's why I had in a certain sense, so much more hope for the psychedelic revolution than actually came to bear. Now, I should say I myself was not a regular psychedelic user. I tried it once or twice, and in each time had a, at the peak of it an, an experience of ultimate unity awareness. And so I that sort of brought home what I already knew but I thought that because that unity experience was so common in psychedelics, I mean, everybody from Aldous Huxley to Alan Watts had written entire books 
on the unity of psychedelic experience. And, and they described their unity experiences when they themselves took psychedelics. Um, and so I thought, because it was so widespread in culture, the taking of psychedelics, that we were going to get this very aware understanding of the necessity and usefulness of a unity experience, a unity consciousness. And I thought the psychedelic revolution would just change the entire society and fairly permanently. But it really didn't. I mean, it stayed kind of a drug of choice during much of the 60s. And people seem to enjoy it immensely and so on. But after the 60s passed into the 70s and 80s, they, you just didn't hear anything about no. it. It just no. sort of dropped off the scene. No, and now you say certain new types of psychedelics are starting to come back. So ayahuasca has been very popular um, and other various new synthetic psychedelics have been catching on with a fairly widespread use. So maybe it will come back. Um, I personally hope so. I still am not much of a drug user, so I have not myself tried a lot of these. I think I tried ayahuasca once, and it was an interesting, fairly unified experience, but it wasn't great. I mean, I didn't have any mind-blowing experiences from it. But I know an awful lot of people that love it. And well, Ken, it. yeah, thank you so much um, for sharing your wisdom and outlining your contribution. And of course. especially uh, you know, on the integral view, the integral philosophy, the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of spirituality. Yeah. It's a very important message for our time. And I'm very grateful. Thank that you. I've enjoyed this very us. much. And I appreciate you giving me a chance to talk. Thanks so much.